Well, this evening, we're going to be looking at uh, the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And as in the, uh, the previous sermons on the, these various subjects, rather than reading that text, which I've already done, uh, I'd like to read for you a, a larger passage having to do uh, with the use of our tongue, or how we use our words, this gift of speech. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is read James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And let me read the entire chapter. And again, this is a sermon in and of itself. And this by itself would be uh, enough for us, and hopefully uh, it will be a blessing along with, um, uh, again, expounding and applying the ninth commandment. But again, let's consider how our Lord would have us to use our tongues and how He would have us not to use them. James writes this, "'Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds." are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be so arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. May the Lord again bless His word to our understanding. We're not going to be going through James chapter 3. This is almost a sermon in and of itself, but I, would, I do want you to understand that the Lord would have us to use uh, the, the gift of language He has given to us uh, to advance the kingdom of heaven, to build others up, and not to tear them down. Now, I think you can see from what James is telling us here that the most powerful ability that we have, either for good or bad, is the gift of language, I think, whether spoken or written. Uh, there's a famous saying that uh, says, the pen is mightier than the sword. And I think there is some debate as to what exactly the author had in mind. Uh, he might have been talking about the power of administration. Uh, you have the power to sign documents that can uh, set wars in action, as it were. Or he was referring to the power of ideas communicated in words. I think there's no doubt that that is exactly what James has in mind here as he tells us about the power of the tongue. 
Now consider how powerful it is. It can be used to do such good things. And it's the means by which we can share the gospel to save souls from eternal damnation. I don't think there is anything that is, that is you know, more powerful and, and certainly a greater work than that. And it's accomplished by words, whether spoken or written. Uh, with language, we can also build one another up and make each other to be more like our Lord Jesus Christ. We can encourage, we can bless. But as you know as well, the tongue can also do a great deal of damage. It can turn people off to the gospel as well as draw them to Christ. It can tear others down as well as build them up. As a matter of fact, the tongue is so powerful, it can even be effective to cause some people to destroy themselves. James warns us, see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And actually, as you look at the history of the world, uh, you know, movements that have either impoverished or destroyed many people have begun just by somebody's idea written down. Now, because language is so powerful, we shouldn't be surprised that there is a commandment that is devoted to it in the Ten Commandments. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This evening, what I want us to consider is how we should use the tongue to love our neighbor rather than to destroy them, and in loving our neighbor, to love God. So let's consider what this commandment is, first of all, specifically aimed at, and then secondly, let's see how it more uh, broadly applies to the way we use our tongues in relationship to others. Now, first of all, let's consider what is specifically aimed at in this commandment. And I think you understand that this commandment is not spoken to tell, or merely to tell us that we shouldn't lie. It has to do with that. But more specifically, it has to do with not bringing false witness against our neighbor. What it envisions is a situation where we're called upon to testify, perhaps in a dispute, perhaps in a court. And in situations like that, the Lord is telling us that we are to speak the truth, that we are not to lie, to bring testimony that is not true against someone else. Basically, that's, um, that's what's behind what used to take place in the court when you lay your hand on a Bible. And you would swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Now, it's interesting that in that one vow, as it were, that one oath, you were actually invoking two commandments, uh, the, the, the third commandment and the ninth commandment. If you're going to swear by the name of God, then you'd better make sure that what you're going to say is true because you're calling God to bear witness to it. And if you're going to bear witness um, regarding your neighbor, then what you say about your neighbor better be true. It better not be a false witness. You know, I, I was tempted to read and, and probably could have just as well read the account in 1 Kings 21 of the abuse of this principle. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with the story about Naboth and his vineyard and how that vineyard was next to King Ahab's palace. And he wanted that vineyard for himself. So he approached Naboth and he wanted to either trade for it or to buy it outright. But Naboth refused because it was his family's inheritance. It would be a reproach to him to give it or even to sell it to someone else. Now Ahab didn't like the outcome of that and he was rather depressed about it. And when Jezebel saw that he was depressed and found out why... She said, I will get that vineyard for you. Don't worry about it. It's really quite easy. All she had to do was have the king throw a feast, uh, hire a couple of worthless men to accuse Naboth falsely of cursing God and the king, have him executed, and then take the vineyard. And that's exactly what she did. And apparently Ahab also agreed and... They did it, and of course, what they did, as you well know, is was not pleasing to the Lord. Now, why not? Well, because she, Ahab, and these worthless men broke the ninth commandment. They brought false witness against their neighbor, as well as the third commandment, invoking God to bear witness to this lie, the sixth commandment, which is you shall not murder your neighbor, 
And of course, Ahab began by breaking the 10th commandment, which is you shall not covet what belongs to your neighbor. Now, again, this is exactly what the commandment forbids for obvious reasons. In those days, any fact was to be established on the basis of two or three witnesses. And really, what was to keep two or three from conspiring together to take just about anything they wanted by way of false witness or false testimony? Well, there was also a warning that if you bring a false testimony, if you bring false witness against your neighbor and you happen to be found out, then what it is you intended to do to your neighbor would actually be done to you. In Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 through 21, we read this, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Whatever you intend through your false testimony will be done to you. Boy, if this were practiced today, I think there would be a great deal more fear, a lot less of this uh, uh, litigation against people to sue them uh, for whatever because they'd be afraid the same thing might happen to them. Now, again, love is the fulfillment of the commandments. Can you see the love behind this that dictates to us that we speak the truth about others, especially when we're testifying. I mean, the purpose of our testimony is to punish the guilty, but is to vindicate the innocent, not to punish the innocents. The Lord would have us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, that much I think is is clear, but we do need to understand that there is a larger principle here. We need to love our neighbor with our words and not use our words to injure them. Uh, There's other ways that we can be false witnesses against one another besides those instances uh, within disputes in courts of law, such as spreading damaging lies about someone. We call that slander. Now, what does God think about slander? We've already seen in our call to worship that those who practice this sin cannot ascend the hill of the Lord or dwell in His tent. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. O Lord, who may abide in Your tent? Who may dwell on Your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Really, slander is perhaps the most damaging thing that we can do to anyone. Some have ruined others' reputations. Some have ruined their lives by the slanderous things that they have said about them. The Lord would tell us to speak the truth and not to lie regarding our neighbor. But now the question might arise, what if what you have to tell about someone else happens to be true and it's not a lie? Does that mean it's okay to broadcast it and to share it with everyone else? Well, what if that truth damages their reputation for no good reason? Perhaps, uh, you know, unnecessarily because, you know, there are times when we do need to speak the truth regarding others to work with them to bring them to repentance. If they happen to be in sin, we need to come to them and tell them the truth. Or if um, we tell it to somebody uh, else uh, so that they're not, or we tell it regarding someone else so that they're not falsely accused. Um, 
In other words, we may need to, to speak the truth about what somebody did because another person is really behind it to vindicate someone who may be falsely accused. Now, there are good uses for the truth, but if it's not necessary to tell something you know about someone to somebody else, if there's no good reason for it, that is called gossip. Now, what does the Lord think about gossip? Well, for one thing, He points out that it will undoubtedly injure our neighbor if we say something about them, if we broadcast the truth. It will also very likely destroy their relationship with others. I don't know if there's anyone here who hasn't been the object of gossip and haven't found people avoiding you or, or angry at you or even separating themselves from you because of that. Solomon writes this in Proverbs 17, 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. How can we love others if we tell truths about them that are damaging to their reputation for no good reason? You know, the, the, the Lord in His Word actually tells us that gossip is a form of slander, and so it falls under the same censure. We're actually told not to associate with those who, who slander, or actually gossip slash slander, because if we listen to them, we're actually participating in that same sin. Now, I realize that this, you know, convicts, I'm sure, all of us here, because we have listened to things that we shouldn't be listening to, and perhaps sometimes we've enjoyed hearing uh, things that other people have said about others, but we need to realize that even if it's true, if it's being used in a damaging way, it is gossip and it's slander. Solomon says in Proverbs 20, verse 19, he who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. It's interesting. He's using those two terms synonymously, slanderer and gossip, one who reveals secrets. So what should you do with potentially damaging information that you find out about someone else? Well, again, Solomon, uh, addressing this particular issue, says you should keep it to yourself. Certainly pray for that individual. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. If you love somebody else and you know that this particular information is going to, to damage them, then keep it to yourself. Now, what if you don't love them? <laughs> well, then you need to repent because the Lord tells us that we need to love our neighbors. We love ourselves. Now, another interesting thing we could think about is what if, if you tell a lie about somebody that doesn't damage their reputation? What if it actually helps them? <laughs> well, there are situations where things like that can happen. There's really two different kinds of lies, those that injure other people, and we call that slander, as we've seen, but those that could potentially make the other person seem better than they are. We call that flattery. Now, the Lord tells us that we should try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another. We are not to, to boast regarding ourselves, and we are to really boast regarding others and try to honor them, but that's only if there is honor to be given. If there isn't, then it really boils down to flattery. And flattery is usually something that we use because we have some other motive in mind, something we want to gain for ourselves if we try to influence people by exaggerating their good qualities, if we lie to them about themselves. Again, flattery is never good because flattery is always done for a bad reason. There's no good reason to flatter, which is why Solomon writes this in Proverbs 29 or 29:5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. Now, flattery is, it can go two different ways. You can not only flatter somebody else, which we ought, ought not to under any occasion, because again, there's no good reason to flatter. And if you actually end up 
building somebody up in a false idea of themselves, you're not really doing them any good because the Lord would have us to be humble and not proud. But you can also exaggerate the other direction regarding yourself, bearing false witness about yourself. We call that boasting. We call that bragging. And Paul tells us that if we love the way the Lord calls us to love, that we should never even do that. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. And again, Solomon tells us, let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Boy, Solomon was a wise man, wasn't he? I think we do well to read the Proverbs and apply it because it's really the commandments, the Ten Commandments applied to life. It is a very, it was a book filled with a great deal of wisdom that we could use for living. Now, the next question I'd like to deal with is what if you are the brunt or the, the object of the slander? What if somebody slanders you? What if somebody gossips about you? What if somebody tries to flatter you? What are you supposed to do? Well, what you need to do is the same thing that you would do if somebody tried to injure you in some other way. And that is you are not to try to get even, but you are to return good for evil. Jesus says this, and again, perhaps it's one of the most difficult things that he calls us to do. But we must do it because this is what our Lord would do, and this is good, this is right, this is loving. He says this. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Paul writes the same thing in Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know, again, that's one of the most difficult things that the Lord calls us to do because when we happen to be the brunt of somebody's slander or somebody's injury, our first reaction, of course, is anger, and our second reaction is, how can I get even? How can I get back at this person? How can I satisfy my desire for revenge? Well, the Lord tells us, don't take your own revenge. Do good to those who do evil against you and the Lord will take care of the rest. He will repay them what needs to be done in order to make matters right, but He does not want you to take that revenge into your own hands. He wants you to return good for evil. So instead of taking it to heart and getting angry and plotting how to get revenge, think instead about how you can help them turn around and do what's right. Use your language that you would be tempted, of course, to blast them back with. Instead, use it for good to try to get them to repent. Paul kind of summarizes everything that we are to do with our language in this passage in Ephesians 4, verses 29 through 32. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So 
far from uh, you know, returning evil for evil, which is going to be, of course, our first reaction because of the sin that's in our hearts, return good for evil. Speak what needs to be said in order to bring that person to repentance. And of course, in many cases, that means going to them and working towards reconciliation and overcoming their anger with your love. Now, if you do this at the very beginning, it makes the job quite a bit easier, especially if somebody provokes you to your face. Uh, you know that um, very often we, we receive that type of rebuke from people or, or offensive words. And if we answer harshly back to begin with, we simply stir up controversy. But if we can sort of cut it off at the beginning, perhaps we can keep it from turning into such a big mess to begin with. Again, Solomon writes this, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, I just have a, a personal example of, of how that works in my own life. Uh, when I was used to be uh, doing uh, delivery work, uh, one of the things that, that I did was just one piece of service where uh, uh, I could, um, I think, well, at least there was one thing that, that I was authorized to do to repair these water softeners. And somebody came up because they were so angry about something that had happened from our company to them. And the first thing they did was they accosted me with, with you know, angry and hateful language. I think trying to pick a fight. And by God's grace and by His grace alone, I, I was able not to get angry but to basically speak gently and apologetically, not really knowing what the situation was, not really being involved in it. Uh, and uh, because I answered in a soft way, He immediately cooled down and began to think about these things uh, rationally. I think if we're able to respond in a gentle way when somebody speaks angrily at us, well, what Solomon says is true. It turns away wrath. But if we return the rebuke with a rebuke, you see, then we're going to stir up further anger. The Lord says, use your tongue for good. Build up with your words. Bless others and don't curse. Uh, let your speech be for edification. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but that which will be a blessing to your neighbor. That's how the Lord would have you to love them. Again, remember how powerful speech is. You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. Make sure you use it for good. And let's not forget, the most important way to love, perhaps, the most, well, the most valuable way to love others with your words is to share the best of all words with others. And that is what Jesus has done to save sinners. Remember that Jesus has given us a commission. He has laid the responsibility upon us to tell other people about what He has done so that they might repent and come to Him and have life. The Great Commission tells us that we are to go and make disciples of all the nations. Now, not personally, of course, but collectively, corporately, we all have our part to play. And there is no better use of the tongue, nothing that is more honoring to your Lord than to share that message of salvation, what He has done to save sinners through His Son. So let's try to use every opportunity that the Lord gives to us to lead other people to eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do that, know that you will be doing what is most honoring to the Lord more than really anything else you can do with your tongue. May the Lord help all of us to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And again, let's, let's ask that the Lord would help us to repent of our uh, ungodly use of language, if, if we happen to be guilty of that, and even our response to language that comes our direction, and ask that He would give to us a heart that is willing to return good for evil and is also willing to forgive those who have offended us. Let's pray.